Perfect. Thank you, Jim. Thank you to all the panelists um, and to Ben for the lead off talk. That was really interesting stuff. And so this is the section where we go into question and answer. And we've got some questions filling up in the uh, Google Doc. Please be sure to go to the Google Doc and put things there. That's the best way to keep things in one place. I was actually going to kick it off with um, one question of my own. You know, Ben, I really love this idea of infrastructure having convening power, as you as you put it. But I wonder um, how the other panelists think about that, if they've heard that term before or or if that resonated. If anyone wants to comment on how we can spread that power across communities, um, but also then focus how we use it to get concrete resources out of it. The DOE um, has created facilities, as have other agencies that are great at uh, collecting really terrific uh, data in vast amounts and of high quality. But how do we get a, a shared resource like a community repository or something out of that? How do we link people together? Any thoughts on that or plans to actually do that already? So, Dave, I'll try to make sure I understand the question and uh, you know, see if anybody else wants to jump in uh, as well. So certainly, um, you know, to whenever I talked about uh, materials data in general and you asked what, who are the main likely drivers, for the construction of the infrastructure, number one has always been the beam lines. So when I think, because that data is expensive, right? <laughs> and so, if, you know, if you, and you know, and then they're, and they're sending people home with terabyte disk drives. Uh, so if you start to think about uh, where, you know, the sweet spot is, it's really great to see the, uh, the DOE, uh, you know, they have been looking at this for a long time, but I think we're, we, they look to me like they're really taking it up a level, right? <laughs> so uh, it's pretty exciting. So, you know, I'll let the, uh, uh, ben comment on that further if he wants to, but surely we would all agree. I think that infrastructure, you know, that's a good example as well, right? Uh, the capacity to do science and engineering uh, again lies at the heart of the real driving force for getting the sharing off the ground. So that would be my comment. Great. Yeah, I could briefly say that um, I was just. It's on my mind every day now because um, this high performance data facility project and getting its wheels off lifted off from the tarmac um, is all about stakeholder engagement and also providing open venues to we have a lot of information about requirements that say the the BES light sources which are not five facilities they're like 200 beam lines of different sciences and different local cultures providing a transparent way uh, the, to build that momentum of feedback between requirements and the design. So just a, a major thumbs up that uh, we know it's probably also feels late to some communities of like what's taking so long uh, from the Oscar side of this equation. It's like, we know we need to build the big iron that gets sort of melt to I'm crossing uh, aphorisms here. It's like the, the big iron that lifts all ships. That doesn't make any sense. You know what I'm saying? It's like the, 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 the tent will lift up, you know, and underneath it, it needs to be extensible, right? Not only to the ones with most acute pain today, but also an unexplored future we don't yet know of, of use cases. Well, what I would, I can chime in. I, I think absolutely infrastructure is the new uh, town square, right? Where where people gather and, and hopefully the town square is nice and the, the, your backyard, right? And that would allow you to, to come out and spend time and collaborate and work together. And I think as we th think about beam lines and uh, and high power researchers, we also need to think about bringing these to students and uh, to uh, we certainly need to uh, we, we need a, a U.S. domestic work workforce uh, that's much larger than what we have today, and uh, we need to make sure this infrastructure serves. Everyone, right? I, I, I kind of see the beam lines as th those folks whose backyard is probably nicer than the town square, and so uh, we, we need to make sure it's it's uh, available for everyone, and uh, and we get access to the individual researchers, and big groups and smaller groups. I'll add a couple of points uh, along the same lines, but uh, just. Again, I see there are folks here from NSF and, and Ben's here from DOE. Um, I feel that uh, when any federal agency is giving a grant, uh, I think there should be 
uh, a clear uh, a clear stipulation that if you use associated infrastructure, that's viewed positively. But more importantly, when you use the associated infrastructure, be it supercomputing resources or, or facilities for beamline uh, experiments or other <laughs> experiments, you have to bring students in person for training and you have to learn to share data. Uh, and this should be a big part. I mean, many of the grant reviews, when they happen, the data management plan these days is better, but before it was like, oh, this is sufficient. But now it should actually be something that should be uh, uh, reviewed strongly, but more importantly, also seeing how much that is being done. So every year when we submit progress reports, whenever I say something like this, there are immediately folks will say, okay, but everybody doesn't have grants. And that's true. Not everyone has grants, especially early career researchers are still not yet uh, or may not be successful, not all, but may not be successful. In those cases, um, I would say federal agencies and facilities themselves can have a small pool of money to support travel for such uh, early career researchers who've never had grant funding. This way you're getting them access to the infrastructure even before they've had to use it. And they just start off with learning to share and teach students how to, um, uh, how to make data be fair. Um, I, I think that's, that's just my thought based on some of the experiences I've had. Yeah, those are all great thoughts. Thank you. Um, I was going to move on to a, a question from uh, Jonathan Schmidt about uh, criteria for a database to be considered AI ready. We're we're going to talk about AI ready data in successive uh, sessions, but I think this is a really good group to kick this off. And he points out his own example of Nomad having millions of data points and is fair, but the diverse set of calculation parameters and all means you really have to be an ab initio expert to extract consistent data sets from it for ML or know what you're going to do with it. Do you all have thoughts about how we make progress on that front? I, I can start quickly. As long as you have access to those parameters, uh, right, and you can filter and uh, you can do queries and, and uh, uh, do different sectioning uh, of the data, then you can use it. If, if the, the concern is not having access not knowing some of the details of the calculations and and then you're really shooting in the dark and that's that's way more concerning and and of course there's special techniques to combine data that comes from with different origins right so multimodal data so it is possible to learn from data with, what that mixed approximations and whatnot as long as you know what those parameters are yep Anybody else want to go before me? Oh, um, you can go. <laughs> I'll go after you. Everyone doesn't have to answer every question, of course. Okay. Well, no, we I, 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 I We want to answer. And we do. First of all, I love this question because, of course, we've all been using AI ready as a bit of a shorthand. Uh, and uh, you got right to the hard question, right? What does that mean? <laughs> and it's a, it's a way also of sort of shoveling a lot of detail uh, underneath. And it, of course, the answer is it depends, uh, right? It, I mean, what you really want is, again, it's something that's machine actionable so that you could go and grab the metadata and hopefully interpret it. Uh, you know, as, as, uh, as you know, LLMs or whatever, the next semantic uh, processing system comes online and we're able to more quickly sort of decide what the meaning of the data is, I think the easier it's gonna be to then sort of slurp the data uh, into some AI uh, model, uh, right? So we, you just need the metadata, right? But you, but one can be glib about, oh, you just need the metadata, right? So what metadata? Uh, so it, it's a, it's not an easy problem. If it was, we would have just done it. Uh, so I think, you know, a big piece of the market is trying to break it up into, you know, what are the infrastructures that are needed versus what, and then doing demonstrations. Uh, the data quality problem, which Ali brought up, uh, is a really tough one. It's fun though, right? That's a lot of what we all think about. And a lot of that's gonna come down to the usual stuff, right? You know, who generated it? Uh, what code do you trust them? Uh, the, you know, sort of the, the classic, uh, you know, scientific approach that we have to deciding whether or not we trust something. Go ahead. Um I, I will take a quote that some, I forget who have this, but something about fame. <laughs> um, so people get motivated by fame or things that they know will get them promoted. So I know um, uh, Jim brought this up about 
citation and H index, let's move away from that. I say instead, let's do something similar, but but except we recognize the folks whose data served really well for others. So essentially AI ready, ML ready probably is the correct word. So journals actually have a little ability, at least in ACS, if you look at various papers, you'll be able to see which ones uh, results uh, were found to agree with others who did the work later. So you could have a similar ticker or a little thumbs up for papers whose data essentially served as excellent data for training other people's models. And I can tell you in talks when I go speak about work that we use published data, <laughs> I make sure I highlight those authors so they get the fame. Uh, not that they that particular group did it for fame, they just did it because that's the way they do things. So recognition associated with usable data, those who are presenting fair <laughs> data would be, I think, a great motivator. Students don't even know they should do this. There's no motivation, at least not in the US. So there should be a motivation. I think this could be one uh, as like a reward, essentially recognition. Very briefly, this speaks to the importance of workflows. And, and Ben mentioned this, and I, I mentioned it. If it's very important to document and have access to the workflow that was used to generate the data. Yeah. Because English is not a good language you know, to describe metadata. Right. Well, that's so, a great point. Yeah. Go ahead, Ted. So kind of following up on that, um, so uh, one person mentioned fair workflows. Thank you for bringing up this important topic uh, to the table. It wasn't actually a question, um, but she wanted to point that out. And I think that's important too. And I kind of was inspired um, by these talks and it made me wonder, you know, the the fair right there's fair principles and there's a checklist sometimes fulfilling those checklists are almost impossible like do we have a community standard for everything we need um but do we need an equivalent to nor not only fair data but for fair workflows does anyone have thought on that I'll just mention briefly that this has come up a number of times already. Workflows, it's all about software. The uh, You just mentioned about, you know, do we trust the technique as well? Do we trust the software? Arthi, to your point about proprietary software, we've all been, I'm mean, as an experimentalist. Oh my gosh, how many times have we bought the, the shiny new kit and the software is, you know, bubble gum and rubber bands. And so I, I, I triple down, yes, all major thumbs up of community alignment of incentives, community uh, voting with our feet, funders voting with their feet and laying down. I think just briefly, this IRI, this integrated research infrastructure, what we're gravitating towards and what that blueprint activity gave us a year ago was let's focus on open API, dare I say standards, even with a NIST colleague in the room, the standards is the most heavy thing, but at least community rallying points and rallying cries for you know, when we're talking about interfaces for software, all the way from instrumentation and then up the software stack to the venues where people need to go fast and furious with writing their own code, that we at least have uh, two things, documented what we can about the interfaces, but also, I know this sounds simplistic, venues, times and places at, at community conferences or, or ad hoc meetings where we're coming together both as domains, but then also in that layer above or integrating across to grapple with the, cho the design choices in software. Just, just a, a quick comment. I, I think our community needs to understand that making workflows, say, available on GitHub, it's not enough to make them fair. Uh, we, you know, you can't imagine how long it takes to. Uh, be able to implement and get all the packages lined up and all the libraries that were used. And so this really needs to be containerized and it needs to be uh, shared in a way that's ready to run with the right environment that was used to uh, uh, develop the, the software. And this is very, very important. And I think journals and, and publishers need to be a better, do a better job at uh, taking us beyond just putting, a, you know, a bunch of Python files on Git and saying, you know, now I've shared my my uh, 
my software. That really shouldn't satisfy anyone. I, I so you know obviously I'm a huge advocate for all of this. Um, this is hard too. It's much harder than it sounds, right? And it takes real resources and investment in, in infrastructure again, uh, right? I, you know, even publishing code is is tricky all by itself. Um, all of the issues around dependencies that Ali was just bringing up, and you know how you make sure that it works five minutes from now, let alone, you know, what do you trust? What do you not trust? Uh, what happens if somebody discovers there's a break in some library that you've been using for 10 years and we've just assumed that it works? Uh, you know, so th there's this sort of nested layer of infrastructures that we're relying on and uh, maintaining that infrastructure is hard. So the right thing in general to do, and I think, you know, Ben was bringing this up too, is to not get so involved in getting it right that you don't do it. Uh, the, the right answer is try your best with what you have and try to live up to some ideal, but go uh, and deploy and then fix. Uh, this is where at the research end of things here. Uh, and, you know, we rely on the commercial software developers to fill in the needs gaps uh, as as things become more mature, hopefully with the understanding that there are going to be standardized APIs at minimum and ways of testing these systems so that even if they're closed in some manner, you have some way of validating. Yeah, Over. I'd like to jump in just a, a second. I mean, it's not I'm not a panelist, but I will say that this question of workflows comes up a lot. Uh, Zach Trout has put a comment in the doc pointing out that there are other people who work on this, right? And there are other projects. But I think one thing that gets um, confused sometimes in the materials world is we have very different types of workflows, right? A workflow for computational science is very different than an experimental workflow. It's very different than a data analysis and visualization workflow. It's very different than making some data fair workflow, which is what most of that work has been done on internationally. And so I think figuring out how to dovetail those things and think about all of those um, is is a central part of what a lot of people are working on these days, including myself and Ale and others. So, uh, but it's it's critical. I think this theme of workflows uh, and making those fair, or being as Jim was pointing out, there's no checklist for fair, right? It's getting in the ecosystem, doing what you can do, and then we'll get better at it. So, so I, I would actually push back just a little bit. Look, I've thought a lot about workflows. A lot of us have tried to think about it, and and to me, it's it's another kind of metadata. Right, it, it's a really important kind in some sense, but you're making the separation between the work and the workflow. And saying, well, this is how I did it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's of course, it's <laughs> somebody you did it, mm -hmm. right? In other words, you know, that's what all you know, you read a paper, they have the experimental section, uh, or you know, procedural. So the statement that we need to tell people how we got the information that we did or the wrote the code is obviously part of the process. So we're making this separation that to me, it's kind of sad that we have to, <laughs> it's sort of frustrating. Uh, of course, you should be telling us how you did it, right? <laughs> right. right. And, and the fact that this uh, somehow is hard is interesting, I guess, right? But telling is not the same, right? I mean, the method section of a paper is not enough to reproduce what you've done. Mm -hmm. And and they start worrying about uh, dependencies and and the ability to run the same code under different libraries and getting different results. Absolutely, I think I, we I have infrastructure to do better. Yeah, that that's all I'm saying. Than just uh, sharing uh, sharing uh, individual files. Yeah, I mean, I, I I mean to get a little bit up further down the line there, I actually think that we need to think about sort of you know meta code right in other words what you really don't want is the software what you want is something at a procedural level um and it, it, it's almost you're right you want a machine to to render it into a to an ex you know into to actual code um yeah. because because of these issues uh but it's a hierarchy then still it is right? a hierarchy but if you want reproducibility you need more than that right you need a container with everything it runs even right, even a container, container may not run on something doesn't guarantee reproducibility right someday that container won't work right i mean so you're, you, you just, do what you can <laughs> right <laughs> anyway
maybe we should move on. We have a, a question from Fatih about um, incentivizing sharing data, making it available is a key enabler. Um, and wondering about, you know, agencies and how they play a role, you know, in expecting not only publications, but the data that generated it. And uh, should there be centralized places for those? Should there be various types of other things? Or um, how do we actually move ahead on that, right? We have policies that say that should happen. But what are some steps, things that people could work on? Well, I'll say briefly, hope it doesn't sound repetitive, is that um, from this top-down perspective of, from an office that um, thinks about large-scale research infrastructure, what we're seeing is that it's all about aligning incentives. I think we've hit on that theme here. And that there's, it's complex, <laughs> I don't want to sound glib, it's complicated so, because some communities sort of already do the vertical integration of all the functions that it takes to take raw data, triage it, analyze it, even build algorithms that are state of the art for IIML, all the way from a sort of vertical integration from raw point of generation to publication. There's a host of other com of communities we see, at least in DOE, that don't have that as a cultural context for the practice of science. That's not a judgment, it's not pejorative. It just means they're graduating the compelling organic thrust forward of science. The practice is drawing these communities into the high performance regime. And some of the folks who wear the research computing hats in those communities are struggling with, oh, by the way, the technology landscape is on fire right now. And we have the purported end of Moore's law, right? Like just the technology trajectories are not easy to understand or the choices that people have about what do I buy? Do I go to the commercial cloud? Do I beg my institution to invest more? Do I try and seek a national resource? So I guess, uh, to me, it's all about aligning incentives and 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 meeting people where they are. And I'm just throwing out a lot of, of cliches here, but truly, I think from a funding agency perspective, when people see, uh, wow, that community never did this before, and they're gaining incredible scientific power, that really gets our attention. That saying we should be really paying attention to is that a portable approach? Should we increase funding? to any one of these roles or, you know, algorithm development, the raw infrastructure, supporting meetings, convenings. There's a whole host of questions that arise when you see those early, what I would call early wins from the top-down perspective of, wow, something really changed here suddenly for a community. So we have a lot more questions. Um... <laughs> Here's one above my pay grade from Phil K from ARPA E, um, which says, given all these discussions on fair and fair workflows and the like, um, do you have suggestions for an agency like ARPA E to focus on potential funding areas that differentiate it from the rest of the government agencies? Wow. Right. You should Ask a lot of people. I bet they have opinions. Right? What should our agency spend money on? <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I'm trying to think about RPE's uh, sort of model as well, right? So one of the neat things about all the ARPAs, right, is you get a program manager who has some nifty idea they can execute at a level that's sometimes hard for some of the other agencies. Um, so thinking about you know, what it is that you think would be a use case, right, where you could, if you had a sufficient amount of well-curated data, could really make a difference to RPE's, you know, top-line mission uh, around energy, I think would be very exciting to, to explore. And maybe that's the subject of a, you know, an afternoon workshop to try to to, I'm not going to tell you which one. <laughs> I don't know. But, but, uh, I was thinking about, some, about yeah. your affection for grand challenges. Yeah, right? so I can say it's a nice grand challenge problem, right? Uh, and certainly the energy space is got a lot of really good grand challenge problems. Uh, so those are almost easy to to list, but to get them in, you know, to get them scoped to the level that you can make a difference with the funding uh, would be very exciting. So. Uh, I would encourage a, a longer conversation on this than we possibly could have on this panel, uh, but it's a, it's a great one. 
And I, one I really think quick I thing is that, that oh, sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry. On. No, no, go ahead, Ben. One venue that comes to mind, and I know we're both in DOE, but that there are certain industrial software packages that have huge staying power because they're essentially indemnified, meaning they're they're so, but they can be old and and sort of not not as innovative as what's out there. And because RPE is such an amazing convening power in its own right, and can flex across industry to academe to government. That's one of the things that comes to my mind immediately is in the applied technology programs. I think some of them are, are itching to sort of push their industry contemplation of advanced software tools forward, but they have a sort of a lock-in effect of of indemnified software. Yeah, but we don't want to go get too down on the uh, commercial software providers. <laughs> but certainly, if there is a all. if there's a market failure because there's a monopoly in a space uh, that there shouldn't be, that's something to look at. Uh, so, you know, that's, I, that's, I, what the, that's what government funding is for. It's to fix market failures uh, if you're in capitalism. So. I, I was going to add that it'd be interesting for uh, agencies and uh, researchers to avoid the, the temptation of uh, inventing something new every time. And so I think one of the challenges, and, and it was brought up in, in with some of the uh, Q&A, is that all of us have, you know, want to go and, and do it ourselves and, and start from scratch as opposed to uh, using and enforcing the, 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 the rules that we already have for ourselves in terms of sharing data. So I, I think something that agencies could do is uh, make their um, PIs uh, adhere to their data plans and evaluate their data plans a little better, right? And try to say, try to encourage the use of the infrastructure we already have. And as opposed to saying, okay, I'm going to put my stuff on my website. There's a lot of infrastructure, lots of investments from DOD, from NSF, uh, from DOD, on infrastructure that we should all use, right? We we publish on, you know, establish uh, publishers. You know, I don't say, well, I want to publish my papers. I'm going to make the Strachan Journal of whatever, right? But with data, we tend to do that. Each lab creates their own way of publishing their data and their software. And that's that's not the most efficient way to spend our resources and our time. Um, you know, can I add true. something? Go ahead. And do we have a moment? No, your turn. Um, so we can keep talking here about all these great things while we all sit in our desks and think of policies. In the end, most of the data is coming from younger generation researchers that are either interning in national labs or are in academic labs. Uh, we can say all the things we want to say. In the end, we have to make it so that we support uh, those researchers, give them the time and also motivation, inspiration to actually do things that we all are discussing we should do. We can ask for, uh, you know, extra uh, uh, um, resources of any form. But if in the end, the students and the postdocs and the young researchers and young scientists don't think that it's important or don't want to do it, it won't happen. And I really think that's at least in all the collaborations that I've been part of, I've never had any PI tell me, oh, I have a problem with that. It's then I have to make the effort to go talk to all the researchers in their labs. And I can't change the lab culture overnight. And so this has to come right from the basics in classrooms. If someone's teaching a rheology class, a big part of that class needs to be Hey, when we use this instrument, let's talk about how we will store data. I know it sounds silly, but we can have all these meetings. I've been to many of these meetings, but then I go into a classroom and everyone's like, I still write data on my uh, hard copy notebook. Be like, are you serious in this? And yes, there are really good labs where they still do that. So I think we can talk about all these things, but unless we have an education plan at the very basic, where we basically tell students the day you enter the lab, regardless of what you do in your life, you have to learn that putting data out there in a way that others understand with a workflow, explanation, metadata, that is, that's the same thing as ethics. It's as expected 
as uh, as you being ethical in a lab. If we emphasize that, I think many things might become easier um, and then we can plan all these grand things.